we'll do a little bit of discussion back and forth before we open it up. So um, one uh, follow-up I have for Roy is that, that you've talked about how important this is, and again, there's lots of airtime devoted to the subject, but yet we don't have you know, that many household name success stories of, of companies that have totally. gotten big. And then even as, as, you know, we've been searching here at Stanford for partnerships for, with even medium-sized companies that you haven't heard of, there's just not that many that are serving a lot of people right now. Could you talk about um, why that is and also what makes you optimistic, um, you know, to keep investing? Well, <clears throat> some, a lot of things about startups are paradoxes, and so one of them is that in some ways, the harder you try to have an impact, a social impact, you may be more difficult to have one. And I call this you know, the 1% of Amazon or 1% of Microsoft problem, which is if you want to have a big impact, shifting the behavior of some player by a little tiny bit might matter more than all of the new entrants. And so we absolutely do have startups that are household names that are active on this issue. I mean, Uber, Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash, you know, just keep going down the, on the list. And so I think a big part of the question for us in terms of um, creating a more positive shared prosperity is how we influence the trajectories of those companies. One of my views is you might have to get them early um, and create an environment that's more conducive. Um, and then, um, and then, but I also agree with your statement that we have too few examples of companies that have been explicitly focused on this and sort of really carried it as part of their mission. I don't have any guidance to offer other than I hope the future will look better than the past and let's find every little green shoot that we can and protect it and nurture it so it can grow. Yeah, and, and Eric, what do you think? And I mean, how do you, you, you know, you, you, put, you gave more of a research presentation, yeah. well, but how, what, how does your research inform well, this? Well, let question? me pick up on that last question. Actually, I'm a lot more optimistic in terms of uh, the potential. I, I think they haven't been getting as much attention, but there are a lot of companies that are using technology to create shared prosperity, inclusive innovation. Uh, we started something called the Inclusive Innovation Challenge at MIT a, a few years ago, and I was just blown away by the number of companies that entered this million dollar prize. Um, let me just describe some of them so you, you know, to make it less abstract. So, so Iora Health is a company that's using technology, creates a platform um, to, uh, well, let me describe the problem a little bit. Uh, when doctors prescribe uh, treatment, oftentimes, it's a good treatment, but people don't take the pills, they don't change their diet, they don't do the exercise, they don't do whatever they're supposed to be doing, and most doctors don't have the time or maybe the skills to follow up. So our health created a platform to create a, a layer of people who have maybe not lots of medical training, but they have high skill in other ways, particularly emotional intelligence. They're good at coaching and motivating people, and then they follow up with the people, and they got them to, uh, to do the things that were recommended and they had a huge increase in compliance and therefore a decrease in costs. The insurance companies were happier, a lot better. Uh, there's another one called uh, 99 Degrees Custom that actually is bringing back textiles to the United States, um, which is an odd thing to do, but the reason they do it is they've got a technology for making much more custom, uh, unique uh, textiles, and they need some high-skilled workers to do it, so it's not competing with low-wage people in, in Bangladesh. But there's, there are literally hundreds of these companies that are doing little, little things. Overall, they've re raised over a billion dollars of funding now and affected, we counted about 200 million people being affected by it. I just don't think they get as much attention in the press as you know, Amazon or Google or Facebook and some of the, the good and not so good things those companies are, are doing. And I would love to see more attention to those smaller companies that are using technology that because because you know, bring it back to my research a little bit. I mean, you can use technology to substitute. You can use it to complement. And to some extent, that's a choice. And it, it may be, an, an entrepreneur may be indifferent. Either way, they may make a million or a hundred million dollars. But from society's point of view, I think we want to steer them more towards the complement rather than the substitute. With the substitute, a lot of that wealth ends up in the hands of one person or a small group. With the complement, you create a lot more people participating. You can do policies at the government level, but to the extent that the government is dysfunctional or not doing that, then you also want to encourage entrepreneurs to do it for, for good or just because they realize they can make money doing it. And that's more the direction that we've been pushing. I loved your line on, um, on it's not going to be the AI that replaces the people, it's going to be the people with AI that yeah. replace the people without <laughs> that's, AI. That's and right. I think it sort of calls to that. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and Eric's point, I think, is, is also um, a central theme of our new Institute on Human-Centered AI here exactly. at Stanford, 
um, with the idea that, just as Rory said, that the, the government and the government through universities are the first venture capitalists, and in some sense, we can redirect the innovation in AI to be more complementary and human augmenting, that could in turn influence the ecosystem that follows. So I also want to come back to something that you, that you dwelled on at the end, Roy, about diversity. Um, yesterday on the California Future of Work panel, we had some discussions about um, challenges with you know, racism by employers and the inability of people with, to, except for the people with the perfect credentials in the top schools and the right race and gender and so on to get those people had a good time getting jobs, but it was harder for the rest and algorithms might even, in, if, if not carefully guided, reinforce that because they're just gonna reflect what the employers want. And we talked about yesterday how that's really a two-sided problem. You need to both you know, have the workers be able to express their skills and also the employers trained to understand them. We'll come back to credentialing, I think, when we talk in the education panel, but you went past that pretty quickly in your presentation. Could you say a little more about how we can, we can solve that two-sided problem? Sure. Uh, so there's a myth in the technology industry that the product progress of technology has these inevitable consequences like algorithms produce bias mm -hmm. for example and I, the way i think of it is more like the weather you can't stop it you can shape it and these choices are the product of choices i mean some of them we may be conscious of and some not and so you know a variation on what eric just said about finding complementary uses is let's find every possible chance we can to a elevate um, diversity, inclusion, awareness as much as we can, and B, to invent things that actually do something about it. I mean, I'll give you an example. We invested, and I'll try to talk about as often as possible about companies we didn't invest in, because my intent is not to talk about my book, but when I believe something and find somebody working on it, I'll often end up as an investor in it. So there's gonna be, you know, to your point about conflict, let's be transparent about it, but that's the reason. We invest in a company called Textio um, that is uh, two Microsoft and Amazon alums who uh, took the notion of spell checking in a word processor, one step forward, spell checking is a, a, a backward looking idea, right? You've already made an error and here comes squiggly red line. Theirs is a forward looking idea. If you write this job description in this way, will it attract women to apply to the job as the same race, rate as men? Um, uh, and turns out you can use the data to do that. And once you feed that back in and people discover that there are certain word choices, and some of them are surprising. It's not masculine words attract men. You know, the, the, the consequences can be really surprising and there's only way to get at that and influence the behavior in real time of the person who's about to hit control P or whatever you hit to post it on Indeed uh, for their job description is, uh, is to have technology in that loop. Well, that's a great thing. I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm actually more optimistic about the, uh, increased inclusion, these technologies can definitely be used to amplify and replicate the biases that we already have, and that's definitely a problem. But at the same time, I think ultimately they're easier to fix and to move mm. forward and to make in a way that is more inclusive. I mean, the reason that we have a lot of these problems in the first place is because humans are biased, racist, sexist, have, have implicit issues, and we work very hard to try to overcome those and get people to overcome them. And we're making some progress, but I think ultimately, I, I feel, maybe I'm too much of a uh, technophile, but I feel like it's probably easier to see the issues in the technology and then have a Turing box or something that says, okay, here's the problem, let's fix it and iterate and improve it, and the path often can be faster in that direction. Yeah, and I mean, I actually don't have a view on whether it's going to be easier or harder. I think it's gonna be easier and harder, some ways and harder in others, mm -hmm. but I think whether it's easier or harder, it is controllable if we pay attention to it, and that exactly. to me is the important thing, is that we can influence the outcome. That's right. Excellent. All right, well, so let's open it up now to um, questions from the audience. We have some microphones that'll come around. Um, looks like we have one over here. Hey there, so nice to uh, see you both. Um, I am Frida Pauli, I'm the co-founder of a company called Pymetrics. Um, I just wanted to kind of just, I have a question for you guys, but I just wanted to tell you very briefly, Pymetrics uses behavioral science. I used to be a cognitive neuroscientist at Harvard and MIT, um, and uh, ethically designed AI to basically match people to roles. And I think we are doing a lot of this future of work stuff, so we're definitely not Google or Amazon or any of those big companies, but I think we're, um, a, you know, a, just 
one solution. And I do think that, you know, we kind of had the premise that um, you can audit artificial intelligence, but um, as a cognitive neuroscientist, I'll tell you, you cannot remove bias from humans. It's just physically impossible. All the literature will, will, sh will tell you that. Well, the question I have for you guys actually is, um, and you know, we work with David Autor up at MIT and other academics. I think one of the challenges we've had, two challenges I would say, one is that at least the field of employment we work in is regulated. So there's a lot of regulation, um, federal regulation by the EEOC that sometimes can hinder some of the progress. And we're actually doing some policy work um, here in California and in New York to, to try to mitigate that. So curious if you guys have any thoughts on that. Um, and the second thing I think is that, you know, when it comes to algorithmic bias, um, it's such a hot button. I mean, just in the New York Times, there was a something that came out uh, this week by Ifoima Ajuna from Cornell, basically talking about the challenges. And, um, and I think one of the things that's missing right now, I'd love to hear this audience thought, are really just some sort of external standards that could say, here is how we can um, create ethical AI or unbiased AI or whatever, and here's how we don't do it. So those are just two questions I wanted to kind of put to you guys if you had thoughts. Well, first off, I, I agree with your point that in, in humans are, are also biased, and, and that, that's something we shouldn't ignore. And, and that's why it's sometimes frustrating when I hear people say, let's not, is this on? Yeah. It, is not, not, not use the uh, machine until it's perfect. We're, we're probably not going to have perfect machines, but they may be better. Um, well, in fact, I'm sure we won't have perfect machines because um, there's been research that, that if you have a number of, of ethical criteria, it's mathematically impossible to satisfy them all at the same time. One of the interesting things it does is it forces us to be very explicit about what trade-offs we want to make. And that can be uncomfortable, um, but it, it forces us to say, wait a minute, exactly are we maximizing accuracy or minimizing bias or, or what, which kinds of bias? And depending on what our, our values are, we may make different choices. When humans are doing it, it's kind of all very fuzzy, and we can kind of blur over those moral choices. But one of the things that, that machine learning or computers in general is doing is, is making us be much more explicit about what trade-offs we want to make. And that's probably, in the long run, a good thing for us to have that conversation and do it out in the open and use whatever mechanisms, democracy, experts, conferences, to try to hash out what those values are that we care about. I mean, the, the, the broad lesson I take from, from the work here is that as our tools get more and more powerful, it means we have more power to change the world, sort of almost by definition. And that means that our values matter more than they did before. And we have to be very explicit about how we want to apply those values. And do you, just, uh, just uh, I was going to jump in on the creation of standards, of ethical AI standards. Do you have thoughts on standards? Well, I think one of the reasons that we, I think we have the human-centered AI initiative at Stanford and other initiatives are, are growing elsewhere is that the technology has rushed so far ahead, and that's great. I want to keep, keep rushing ahead, but we are now confronting all these questions we didn't have to deal with before about privacy. It used to be physically impossible for me to look in your file cabinet right. in your office, and, and now if you have it in the cloud, you know, we have to have some rules, and all, all the other standards. So right now, there's, there's a, a need for us through multiple mechanisms, through you know, ethicists at universities, uh, pu public conversations, uh, government you know, candidates running for office, all of them need to bring up these issues. And I think that's the part of this whole conversation that's way behind is the ethical side, the reinventing work side, all the sort of softer social science side. We've got science fiction, but we need to have sort of social science fiction catching up. Yeah, and I guess my feeling is I think I agree with all of that, and I think there's plenty of time to intervene because for the onrush of AI, I mean, you know, for those of those of you who work on AI in the room, most of the AI that's actually used in the business world is some form of regression analysis. I mean, it's we're not really we're talking about stuff that you know even I failed to do well as a, an economist student. So you know you can. It's not really happening so rapidly that we can't intervene overnight. We can. Um, I am skeptical of organized efforts to try to articulate some clear principles in part because the state of the art is changing so much, in part because the sources of resources for them often have enough marketing bias in there that it turns into a marketing exercise. So what's the alternative well, that you like better? No, I think it's conversation and mm -hmm. development 
of ideas around it. I mean, it's as opposed to the goal being an outcome of a standard. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think continued. we're going to have some experts yeah. in the US Congress where I just testified and I sure. away, kind of That's disillusioned definitely. about their ability to make decisions yeah. there. Um, yeah, yeah, no, but, but I, I think that as with a lot of these things, there's a multiple different That's right. things going on simultaneously. That's right. And, and I'm, I'm glad there's this initiative at Stanford that, that's taking on very aggressively. Yeah, I mean, just to say, you know, if you think about um, the, before you say there's going to be a, a set of standards, we at least need to articulate the trade offs. And yes. so a lot, of, a lot of people don't understand those trade offs. And then actually, just to plug the academic industry partnership angle a little bit, mm -hmm. if someone from Facebook stands up and says, oh, it's actually really hard to have fair content moderation because if there's more fake news on the right than the left, then my false positive and false negative rate can't both be equalized. Right. Somebody says, blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. th th that's Facebook, they elected Trump, I hate them, or whatever, or, or that's Facebook, they're liberal, you know, I hate them, and nobody actually listens to what they're saying when in fact they just stated a scientific fact. Um, but it, nobody wants to hear it coming from, you know, the company themselves. Yeah. And so with the, the part where you delineate the, the possibility set, say, yes, actually there is a real trade-off, yeah. and actually even having people discuss the value the values that go into that trade-off outside of a company can be much more beneficial. And hopefully that can focus the conversation so that if, you know, if people think, oh, let's just make it perfect, and then, as Susan said, well, let me, we can just prove that you're not going to be able to maximize all these things simultaneously. Now you can have a much more focused conversation yeah. about what's actually feasible. Yeah, I mean, I think one way that I describe that, and I'm really, I mean, the, 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 prep, the academic industry partnerships are essential for figuring this out. I'm really just talking about the, the end object of like, this is now the rule set that we will need to follow. I don't know an analogy for that from any other place. And I'd say one way I think about it is trust, which is to say, when you hire a new person onto your team, you don't let them make the team's most critical decisions the first day. And the ultimate black box is the black box of inside the human mind. We are no more auditable than you know, a complex um, machine yeah. learning model. It, and it, that analogy, I don't want to overdo it because we don't want to anthropomorphize the machine too much, but I do think it works in a surprisingly wide variety of cases, which is to say, if you have an algorithm that you think is capable of making an important decision, Test it gradually first. Hit the bumps. Realize the trade-offs. I mean, we ha we need a trade craft around this. My partner um, James Cham calls it. We need a Peter Drucker of AI because his view is that the sort of line managed, goal oriented way of doing things just doesn't apply in the continuous feedback loop of decisions that data leads to better decisions, leads to more data, et cetera. And I think we're developing that managerial practice as an industry. All right. So another question from the audience over here. So you wanted somebody from Facebook to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Got that. But I'm going to ask a completely different question. So uh, Eric, you spoke about uh, which tasks and which jobs can be automated by machine learning. Right. I'm wondering about the gap between that and technology in general. Mm -hmm. Are there other technologies that yeah. are, are behind the corner, around the corner, yeah. uh, or even within the broader scope of AI, yeah. that would actually change the numbers that you have, or are we hitting some uniquely human capability that is not automatable, and if then, what if we had computers that could understand emotion, show compassion, how would that affect? We already numbers? have those, sorry. <laughs> Tamagotchi, you have kids? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we pick machine learning because we have spent a lot of time talking to folks and there was really a kind of a quantum improvement uh, in the past eight years or so. But that said, we are now taking this methodology and applying it to a number of other technologies. So we're doing it right now with robotics because machine learning is mostly cognitive tasks, perception and cognitive tasks, and there's a lot of physical things that there are some folks, especially here in Silicon Valley, who are very optimistic about the improvements that may happen in robotics in, in the near term. There are others that are more pessimistic, but we're, we're looking at, at those. And then, we should have done this first probably, we're also doing a set of a rubric for uh, traditional, you call it good old fashioned AI or, or uh, procedural knowledge, the kind of coding that, that really dominated, you know, they created a multi-trillion dollar industry over the past 30 or 40 years. That has not played out entirely anywhere nearly either. So we will we'll eventually have these three different rubrics that we, we run in parallel. I, I, you know, as to whether or not we'll be able to do the full spectrum of human things, I mean, we're getting, I'll, I'll, it's worth just briefly speculating. My, my take is that there's nothing, there's no law of physics that prevents that from happening someday. And I think that's why a lot of people are very focused on that. But more importantly, 
I don't see it happening anytime soon. I don't see it happening in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. You know, apologies to Ray Kurzweil and, and others. Um, and so the problem I think we need to focus on right now is what are the set of tasks that are likely to be affected currently. And I don't think that we're going to have mass joblessness or most jobs or most tasks being eliminated. It's, it's much more a matter of, of major restructuring. And then how do we make sure that the income is there for those people whose jobs are affected. And that kind of refocuses the types of solutions you might want to focus on, the types of problems you want to focus on, rather than this um, scenario where, where there's nothing left for humans to do. Hi. Um, quick question for Roy. This is, uh, my name is Moses. I work at um, Orange, which is a telecom company in Europe, uh, sort of like a Verizon in the US. And my question for Roy, and you and I, we kind of talked in our group here a little bit about impact investing. You had a really interesting slide that said capital of all patients. And I'm wondering if you could just comment a little bit about kind of the state of where we are in venture capital broadly. Um, we're definitely at sort of a, a certain point in our cycle, I think. But at the same time, how can fund managers who have fiduciary responsibility to limited partners really drive towards thinking about unintended consequences, bias, and how can an investor begin to do diligence on companies to help sort of safeguard um, some of these risks and think about those. If you could just comment a little bit on that, would be great. Wow, there's a lot. I mean, thank you for raising Moses. It's an essential set of questions, and there's a lot in there. Um, well, first, just a general comment on the state of VC. There is so much activity that if we can't fix these issues now, it's hard to imagine better conditions under which to address them. Um, you know. So that's one thing I'd say. That's why I have a lot of focus and attention on trying to carve this right now. Second, um, I think there's a trade craft emerging around how to understand the consequences to the world of what you invest in um, that is really powerful and important. And I'll give you examples of things that I don't think work. I think there's this sort of guns and butter, Pareto frontier analysis of like, well, maybe I'll trade down a little bit on impact, on return, but I'll have more impact. I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, because I don't think that it measuring impact is not a single number, um, you know, as we were discussing earlier. And I just can't quite imagine that trade-off. And it seems like you more often than not, with all due respect to any impact investors in the room, you can end up with organizations that are neither fish nor fowl. Like I'll tell you, when we invest in a company that we believe is going to have a lot of impact and an impact investor shows up, sometimes, depending on who the investor is, that's bad news because we're like, they're not going to behave rationally, you know, in an economically rational way. They'll be unpredictable. They'll have motives that are harder to discern. Like, we invest to make money, not because making money is the most important thing, but because then at least somebody can discern what I'm solving for in any given situation. Now, what I do think works is limiting the scope of companies you'll invest in to things that you are good with. So for sure, lots of people avoid obviously immoral things, but avoiding more things. Um, you know, we passed on a company because we didn't feel comfortable with what that founder's um, approach to privacy was. And one of my, I'm, I'm a believer in the stakeholder capitalism um, idea, uh, but one of the places where I think shareholder capitalism deserves, you know, a, 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 a sympathetic look is it all depends on what time horizon you're solving. Because eventually all of those stakeholder threats become re threats to returns, too. Um, so there's that. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is, as investors in early companies, we do have a lot of influence. Um, you know, we don't have as much control as people think because the founders have lots of choices about where to get money from. Um, but we certainly have a seat at the table, and um, we certainly have the ability to set norms and expectations as a community. And so I think it might be those levers as opposed to some magic model of like, well, if you only set up your fund this way, everything follows from the structure. I don't know those solutions, but I do know the solutions of an emerging trade craft. All right, so we're, we're closing to the end. Maybe we have, do we have, what, somebody else have a microphone? Did, did we, I mean, I'm sorry, was there somebody else waiting for a question? Does somebody have a final question? All right, over here. Um, on an mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick Brothers. Um, 
I know EdTech's the next panel, but how do you guys think about workforce mm -hmm. as it relates to education? Because it's, it's getting blurry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had this discussion over email in preparing for this that we couldn't figure out what the line was ourselves. So we basically said, well, we'll just talk to each other about what we're doing and hope. I mean, we had something around like, well, if you call yourself education, then you're ed tech. I'm, the answer is it's a, it's a set of continua that all overlap. And I don't know. I'm not sure what hangs in the balance of answering that question is part of why I kind of right. struggle with it. I'm not sure why the answer matters. Well. I have the same view, but I think it matters tremendously. Okay. And the reason is because they are—they are—they are, they do fit together right. so sure. well. And as you learn about which kinds of workforce changes there are, I think one of the most important things on my list, maybe because I'm an educator, is you know. So let's think about educating people to have the right set of skills. In fact, that machine learning rubric that we developed—I mean, some of the companies wanted to know where machine learning was going to be affected. But the interesting thing was most of the companies we talked to were more interested. Let's look at the inverse of that. What are the things that humans will still be doing? That's what they really cared about because they want to focus their training and education on that. Mm. And so there are some areas that uh, that's going to be very important. Um, one is in creative work, you know, figuring out large scale problem solving, asking the right question because machine learning systems can't do that. They're great once you have it structured, but humans can, are for now needed to figure out how to structure it. The other huge category that's even bigger, I think, is, and, and Roy alluded to this, is, is you know, EQ or interpersonal skills. It, it's not like there's just one dimension of intellectual skills that are, are important or not important. The, the ones that the machines are the weakest in are in coaching, leadership, uh, persuasion, selling, negotiation, caring. Uh, these are things that you don't want a machine learning system to be trying to do, but there's a lot of work in society that need to be done. And many of those also can be trod, taught or brought out so I think there's a whole set of things. We're going to have to reinvent education. We're trying to at, at different universities to focus more on formulating the problem, working in teams, coordinating, and, 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 and motivating other people. Uh, those are the kinds of, of skills that will be increasingly needed before. Although I do want to say, I just very briefly, when, when, when uh, Roy dissed teaching coding, I usually don't have that on my list, but I want to put it back on the list just because usually I'm on a panel with a bunch of technologists who are you know, Daniela Roos, my, my dear friend, who's the head of the AI lab at uh, MIT, talks about turning coal miners into data miners. And first, I think that's going a little too far. That's definitely going too far. I think that not everyone is going to become a, a coder. But I, I do think that there, there's a reason that that's so much in demand. And it's not just because tech people want to make more people like themselves. It's because they're paid incredibly well because the market is saying we do have a shortage. It's just that I don't think that that's... 90% of the workforce, most of it, 90% is the other two things I talked about, but I would still reserve a really valuable 10% for the, the coders. I, I accept all the caveats to the disk, but if I, and if I can just add one more sentence yeah, before we close, which word. is these questions about what's left for humans, I call it the last job question, mm -hmm. they tend to bring out all these emotions in us because it's scary to think about it. And there is a bedtime story that like empathy and and, and the, 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 the human skills are, will be left for us. First of all, I think that's nonsense. The machines can totally be empathetic. And I'm happy if you want to you, talk you, about that. You want a robot taking care of you? All right, let him have the last yeah. word, though. Okay. Yes. I mean, yes, in many ways. But, but we already express empathy toward machine. Cliff Nass here at Stanford wrote a great book on it, The Man Who Lied to His Laptop. We anthropomorphize the machine. But back on our language. When we talk about those higher order skills, especially in a university context, the implicit assumption there is really higher order skills of working for companies like ours, which is to say CEO information industry jobs. Um, I was just talking with one of my fellow commission members, you know, Tom Khalil got the call out earlier um, from Schmidt Futures yesterday. If you want to see another version of that skills remaining for humans, Fresno has the first public high school for entrepreneurship in the United States. It's a vocational school, 50, like America, half and half, go to college, don't go to college. And their take on it feels much more like how do you manage risk in your life? How do you persuade somebody? to you know, allow you to do something, how do you, dot, 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 not just starting tech companies. But, um, so I agree with all of that with a twist on the valence of how it's done so that it's for everybody, not just for folks like us.